So welcome to the first session. Um, this is around our challenge one, perceptions, motivations, and decisions, and what initiates harmful gambling. And our first keynote speaker is Don Foster. Now, unfortunately, he just couldn't make his commitments in the House of Lords work with being here today, um, but he's recorded a talk for us. He's a, a neighbour. He was the um, MP for Liberal Democrat MP for Bath um, for 23 years from 1992 to 2015. Uh, and he's held a number of front bench positions within the Liberal Democrats and was a minister and then the uh, government deputy chief whip under the coalition. Uh, he's been in the House of Lords since 2015, and he's been a wonderful supporter of our of our work here in Bristol. We're very grateful to him. He'll tell you a little bit more about his involvement in the video. Hello and welcome to today's conference. Uh, I'm Don Foster, and I, especially as a former lecturer at Bristol University, I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person at this very important day. My own involvement in gambling legislation and regulation began in 2004, when as a, an MP, I was on the Commons Committee that considered what became the Gambling Act 2005. And I've been involved ever since. The first parliamentarian to call for a two pound stake limit on fixed odd betting terminals and slower spin rates, and for powers to councils to limit the number of betting shops in a particular area. More recently, three years ago, uh, by now in the House of Lords, I served on the select committee that reviewed gambling legislation. We made a series of recommendations, but keen to see as many of them as possible implemented, I formed Peers for Gambling Reform, and we worked very closely with the all-party parliamentary group on gambling harm, chaired by Caroline Harris, who is also one of your speakers today. And we're not anti-gambling, but like Caroline, I have met too many people who've experienced gambling harm and families of loved ones who have committed suicide because of it. So we certainly believe that regulation needs significant reform. So we've worked with charities, people with lived experience, researchers, representatives of the industry, the Gambling Commission, and no fewer than four secretaries of state and six gambling ministers to try and influence change. Now, when enacted in 2007, the 2005 Act made huge changes to gambling, not least in the advertising of it. But then no smartphones, so no 24 seven casinos in our pockets. We have now, much has changed. And we become used to the cliche that we have an analog legislation in a digital age. But to some extent, it's not entirely fair because the 2005 Act was quite permissive legislation. It allowed for the possibility of changes being introduced without the need for new primary legislation. And it gave the newly created Gambling Commission wide ranging powers to change license conditions and codes of practice. So changes actually have been made including that two pound maximum stake on FOBTs, tougher age verification requirements, tighter rules on VIP schemes, a ban on the use of credit cards, increasing the age for playing national lottery games to 18, and even new rules for online slot games. And even the industry has made some changes, including work on affordability, an increase in the voluntary levy payments by some license holders, and the ban on ads during football matches. But concerns have continued to grow about the harm caused by gambling. Now, at this point, I should mention that we don't have enough research being done on all the related gambling issues. So we should all, and I've been guilty of this in the past, be careful about claims that we make. But it is clear that we have a large number of people who suffer gambling harm including a surprising number of children, an even greater number of people impacted by it, and tragically, far too many gambling-related suicides. So conscious of all of this, all political parties promised in their 2019 manifestos a review. Well, the outcome of the government's review, the white paper, was a long time coming. 
and I've mixed views about it, but its proposals are important steps in the right direction. And at last, they're based on a recognition that gambling should be treated as a public health issue. You know, I was amazed by how hard it was to persuade gambling ministers who came and went of the need to adopt a public health approach to gambling. But we got there in the end. And while we wanted the proposals in the white paper to go further, in some cases much further, they do cover the key measures many of us have been campaigning for for very many years. In particular, tighter regulation of online gambling, sensible affordability checks, a mandatory levy to all gambling companies contribute to research, to education and to treatment, a more effective redress mechanism for individual gamblers and further limits on advertising and marketing. Online gambling products are designed to be addictive with among other features, high stakes and prizes, fast speed of play and the illusion of player control. So I strongly welcome proposals to address all of these issues. And I also welcome proposals for stronger affordability checks but I am concerned about two aspects of the detail. Given that the average household disposable income is under 500 pounds a month, and the industry itself classifies gambling more than 75 pounds a month as high spend, I simply don't understand why the white paper's proposed unsustainable loss trigger is 10 times that amount, should be much lower. And given the white paper acknowledges that online gamblers use accounts with several different companies, why do the proposals only consider the possibility of a single cross-company approach? Surely there should be a single, independently run system of affordability checks. I strongly welcome the proposals for a statutory levy. However, sadly, the white paper is silent on the details. Now we've argued for a smart levy, so that on the polluter pays principle, levy contributions are higher from the most addictive products. Certainly there is a strong case that land-based gambling in arcades, casinos and so on, should pay less than online. And there are numerous other details to be resolved. For example, where does the national lottery fit in? And how do we ensure that in the gap between now and the implementation of a statutory levy, the current voluntary contributions to research, education, and treatment don't dry up. Now, primary legislation is needed to introduce a fully fledged gambling ombudsman, and there's very little chance of a legislative slot in the near future. So I welcome the proposals for fairly immediate improved player redress, but again, lots of details to be worked out. And since the non-statutory ombudsman that we'll get will have less powers than the statutory one, I do hope that the government will at least commit to introduce the necessary legislation to go even further as soon as possible. I also welcome proposals to address some of the gambling companies' marketing activities, such as free spins, free bets and bonuses. But I'm extremely disappointed that very, very little is being done to reduce the way we're all bombarded by gambling advertising and direct marketing. Since gambling advertising was liberalized as part of the 2005 Act, the promotion of gambling products has grown exponentially with an annual spend now of more than 1.5 billion pounds, more and more of it being spent for online marketing. And this growth is coupled with growing public concern over gambling companies using ever more sophisticated means to attract new customers and persuade existing ones to spend more by using a range of techniques to keep customers hooked from disguising losses as wins to offering so-called free money and free spins. A year ago, a group of 50 academics called for badly needed restrictions on the promotion of gambling products and wrote, in our opinion, it has become quite clear that the gambling products being offered and the ways in which they are promoted are harmful to individual and family health and damaging to national life. And they added 
that protecting young people should be a top priority, with unprecedented numbers being exposed to gambling advertisement via the internet and television, and they could have added on the radio during the school run. Reviewing the evidence, the ASA said, several studies found associations between advertising exposure and the behavior of problem and at risk gamblers. And some studies produced evidence that was, they said, robust enough to support the existence of an association between the exposure and gambling behavior. And the white paper itself points to something similar, research showing that gambling advertising and marketing leads to people starting to gamble, existing gamblers to gamble more, and those who stop to start again. You know, other countries are taking action to ban or restrict gambling advertising. The majority of the British public wants us to do the same. I really wish the government would be doing more about this. Failure to address these concerns is, in my view, the biggest lacuna in the white paper. You know, the Premiership's voluntary decision to phase out gambling logos on shirt fronts is surely an acknowledgement that advertising is harmful, the gambling ads will still be seen as often as three and a half thousand times during a game on hoardings around grounds, in match day programmes and even on players shirt sleeves. So no wonder the scepticism about, about the plan to give up front of shirt betting ads only. Frankly, not enough. I believe that a public health approach should lead to a significant curb on advertising and a ban on direct marketing an end to inducement such as so-called free bets and the phasing out altogether of sports sponsorship. But advertising and marketing aside, I do, however, welcome the moves in the right direction contained within the white paper. But given all the information collected during and since the review period, it's frankly disappointing that so much further consultation is taking place before we get any action on them. But those consultations are now underway. And I hope that many of you, with between you such a wide range of knowledge and experience, will contribute to them. Thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, so quite a lot of challenges thrown out there by, by Don Foster in terms of the the, the white paper and particularly in relation to, to advertising. Um, advertising is arguably one of the motivating factors to beginning gambling, which is what this, this challenge is about. And we've got a wonderful panel to maybe take up some of these challenges and give, give their views. So could I welcome onto the panel, uh, Andy Taylor, Michael Bannessy, Steffi De Jens, and Guy Bray. Okay, so um, each of the panel members are going to speak for exactly seven minutes. Um, there will be a sign put up after two minutes, then a sign. Um, and we have a great lineup. So our first speaker is Andy Taylor. Andy is the Regulatory Policy Executive at the Committee of Advertising Practice. And he's going to set the scene for us with his uh, small talk entitled Policymaking and recent developments in UK gambling advertising regulation. And he's worked at the Committee of Advertising Practice since 2010, I believe. I think we've been in contact all during that time. Uh, he's a gambling advertising policy specialist, and his responsibilities include authoring and the upkeep of the UK advertising codes um, gambling rules. He also authored the CAP's 2014 gambling advertising review and led on the introduction of new restrictions on the appeal of uh, uh, gambling advertising for children. So welcome, Andy, and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Agnes, and good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting us along to chat to you. Um, I, uh, obviously, this is a, a research-focused session, so in which case I'm going to hopefully give you a, a very brief introduction to our evidence-based policy approach and basically how you lock into our, um, our system in terms of asking uh, challenging uh, for change, for alteration to the standards which apply to gambling advertising. But firstly, a bit about the system I work for and what we do. The Advertising Standards Authority um, is the UK's advertising regulator. Um, it covers 
media at all, advertising in all media from the sort of the traditional broadcast through to the latest piece of social media with its exciting targeting possibilities, etc. cetera. Um, the system has long been set up. It is a self-regulatory system, but it is locked into various frameworks of statutory backed co-regulation. So for example, um, we regulate uh, TV advertising, broadcast advertising uh, in co-regulatory partnership with Ofcom. And those of you who are familiar with the Gambling Commission's regulation will know that compliance with our codes is a, is a requirement of all operators' licenses. And um, in terms of what our, our codes require, um, we obviously recognize that gambling while it is a legally available product and can be advertised, it is subject to concerns. It's a sensitive category of product that therefore necessitates specific requirements beyond the usual for general consumer products. And um, so we have rules that control, firstly, the placement of gambling ads. It shouldn't be targeted at children. It shouldn't go into media environments where children or for children, where they are significant within an audience. And then the content of gambling ads, the sort of the second uh, barrier in terms of consumer and public protection, ensures that firstly, the ads don't speak to people they shouldn't do, i.e. under 18s. And secondly, that they don't contain the types of messaging, the types of encouragements, et cetera, which sort of play on people's vulnerabilities. And that ranges from the hard end of vulnerability to significant issues around gambling uh, harm, participation, the problems of actual playing gambling, through to just basically all of our, our foibles and our um, our, our uh, sort of susceptibilities in terms of messaging that seeks to play um, on people's sense of self in order to encourage um, encourage gambling uh, participation. It's important to understand that we are, as an evidence based policy. Uh, body practicing evidence-based policy, we are subject to the law as everyone else is. Um, the legislation is clear that gambling advertising is permitted. Um, so you know, we have to start from that point. We are not there to set the parameters for the product. That's a question for government, a question for the system it's created to regulate that product. We regulate downstream um, from that. And what we have to do as well is to focus our efforts on separating out the harms to do with play from harms in relation to gambling as a, a, an advertised uh, product and service. We're not looking um, to use advertising as a means of controlling the product. The product's regulated by government and the Gambling Commission. We're there to ensure advertising regulation does its bit to ensure that advertising isn't of itself harmful. And, and that's why, uh, for example, we have this constant um, challenge that gambling advertising normalizes gambling. Well, it does, because that's what advertising is designed to do. But that is a consequence of the framework that allows a legitimate leisure activity, as the 2000 and Acts Risk Assessment put it, um, to advertise, to promote itself. Um, in terms of, uh, of our evidence-based policymaking, um, I'm mindful that there are lots of researchers in the room. So to give you a, a sort of a, a, a brief window into that, um, I can't really tell you what it is that we're looking for in terms of um, evidence, because we don't have a fixed template. We consider anything. We're there to respond to new and emerging evidence. Gambling is a key sector which is sensitive, something which we need to always be aware of in terms of the potential risks of the product and the risks that advertising might play a part in that. So therefore, we have, a, 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 we have an approach where we're basically open to anyone who, is, who wants to, to focus on questions large um, and small. Um, in terms of the evidence we would consider, um, what I can say is that, that we are more likely to see a package of evidence, sort of multi-method, looking at the problem from various different aspects and perspectives and views, um, ranging from content analysis through to looking at, at experimental impacts of ads, sort of close up in terms of person, uh, the individual's interaction with that ad, all the way through to more longitudinal epidemiological stuff. Um, my advice would be to, to build that package, but also to situate if you're creating a, a, a piece of evidence or looking at something to situate that within the existing evidence base, there is quite a, a decent base developing. It can never be perfect and then always, always can be more. Um, but look to, to put your, your, your finding, your, your recommendations within that wider basis. We look for evidence base in, a, in the broad sense. And also another thing I think to consider is basically what you're asking for. We can't ever obviously deliver a ban on advertising writ large because that's something that is a question for government, question for the gambling commission. That's the framework for the product itself. And there are obviously arguments for that. But effectively, if you're asking us to, to, to do something broad, for instance, to ban a certain type of advertising 
uh, sorry, a certain media uh, from being uh, subject uh, having gambling advertising. Obviously, we need very broad evidence of impact. Maybe if you're looking at a much more narrow marketing practice, um, there's been talk of things like free bets and bonuses. We've obviously intervened at several times on that um, through over the years. Um, but if you are actually focusing in. And on that, it then basically it allows you to create a more narrow, more focused evidence base. Um, and that, to me, is, is one of the, the more straightforward ways in which we can develop our standards and our guidance. We're always open to improving um, the protections that we offer. Um, and just a brief sort of case study example of the, the of missing practice. We recently changed the rules in our code around the appeal um, of gambling ads to under 18s. Um, Basically, GambleAware produced one of, uh, for the first time, a big slug of research that looked at gambling advertising specifically and in a UK context, which we hadn't seen before. And ultimately, it was a very, you know, it's a very messy piece of research. They did lots of things, but it was very good because it gave us the material for us to have a proper look for the first time at what happens in terms of the impact of our restrictions as they, they work in a UK environment. Those restrictions have always been there. Um, and the consequence of it was we found that basically ads compliant with our code were having more of an impact than previously understood. So then in terms of our evidence-based approach, that's a, a, a sort of, you know, you have to make a value judgment on that, but in terms of our evidence-based approach, that translated, <laughs> that translated into new rules on strong appeal, um, which then allowed us uh, to limit the amount, uh, of the, the amount of sort of hooks and things which draw in people's attention, a kid's attention um, in gambling advertising. Um, and that's obviously been in place now for years. So you're not now seeing, for example, as much references to specific the specifics of football, to famous footballers and so forth. Um, so that's a, a, an impact of, of our work. And I have been timed up, <laughs> which is fair enough. That was almost the end. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Thanks very much for setting the scene there. That's great. And it's great tips for the, the research and the audience. Come up with a package, stuff that's triangulated. Um, excellent. I'm sure there'll be there'll be questions on that, but thank you very much for setting the scene. I appreciate it. I'm going to pass over to, to Michael now. Michael is Professor of Psychological Science and the head of the School of Psychological Science here at the University of Bristol. And he is going to talk about advertising, gambling, and the brain. So Michael is an expert in the science of social connection and interaction, and he's received awards from the British Psychological Society, European Society of Cognitive Psychology, for his outstanding contributions to this field. And he works very often with organizations to apply psychological science to everyday behaviors and policy. So over to you, Michael. Brilliant. Thanks, Agnes. Um, and thanks, um, everyone, for coming along. Um, as, as Agnes was uh, alluding to, so I'm an academic researcher here at Bristol, professor of psychology. Um, I'm also uh, a theme lead within the gambling hub on our one of our themes, which is obviously with what initiates harmful gambling. I do that alongside Paul Dobson, who's in the audience um, over there. Um, and yeah, as, as Agnes says, so my work predominantly falls into this, this realm of social neuroscience, which is all about, I suppose, how our brain and behavior responds to agents in our world. Um, and how that might impact our health and our well-being. Um, and when I say agents, that might be another person. Obviously, there's groups of individuals in the room right now. Um, but it also might be a machine, right? You could think about gaming machines and how we might respond to those in our brain and our behavior, or even advertising, which is what I'm mainly going to talk about um, today. And um, our challenge, our, our theme, does a lot of work within this space, particularly looking at the interplay of external and internal cues um, and how those may impact brain behavior and, and so forth. Um, but with regards to the brain, which is what I promised to talk about in my seven minutes, um, I um, there are a few things I kind of wanted to say, really, because there's now, at least in the cognitive neuroscience of gambling, there's, there's now, I think, been quite important um, strides made um, over the last decades or so in both understanding uh, the impacts of um, gambling harms on the brain and the types of brain networks that are involved, and also thinking about how advertising may also play on those networks. Um, and to give you an idea by that, I mean, we we know, for instance, that, um, you know, gambling harms can lead to changes in brain networks involved in things like decision making, in things like reward sensitivity, so particular areas like the prefrontal cortex, the insula. Um, 
these areas, um, effectively, one of the changes that tends to occur in, in, in gambling is that you start to see a greater sensitivity to stimuli in your environment that will activate these regions. So they will activate in a different way, and they will be more readily activated by cues in the environment um, that might trigger them. And sadly, advertising in general um, plays on exactly these same types of brain systems, these, these neural systems. And going back to, I suppose, the, the keynote talk at the start, the the speed at which that happens is incredibly rapid. So even within milliseconds, you will see your brain responses. This is for most people in the room, whether you have experienced gambling harms or not, just in general to advertising, your brain responses to advertising will they'll respond very quickly. Your reward centers, you'll be getting dopamine hits, you'll be getting various dynamics that will play out quite commonly. Um, and of course, then if you have gambling harms, there's a higher risk of that activation because those cues might be more salient for you because our brains are very much salient detectors. Our brain is often making predictions about our environment and looking for things are in, in the environment that's salient to it to help make those predictions. So if you are potentially more prone to detect an advertisement around gambling and you're likely to respond to that quite quickly, there's a higher risk of that brain activity taking place. Um, and again, going back to the keynote, I guess when it comes to advertising, we're thinking about where maybe neuroscience may be helpful um, in this. I think it is one to, to fill, fill that, that debate and those arguments around, well, okay, I mean, there's an example of football shirts that we used, right? There's not advertising on the shirts, but there is also other advertising you will see around the stadium. How quickly is that going to play out? Um, and that's one example where neuroscience can be particularly useful. Um, and of course, it can be useful in many other ways. And other people have done this over the years by looking at just how different labelings and different wording and advertisement may change brain activity. Um, and or looking at how things like the use of near wins um, in various um, gaming systems may also do this impact. So neuroscience, I think, is there to help provide a source of information into that remit. It is also helping in that space to develop some potential interventions that might come out of this. Um, but one of the things that I did want to do really more, I suppose, from the point of view of a conversation starter and a capacity building conversations we're having today is just to say there is also, I would say, a bit of an allure with neuroscience. And when, even here, when I'm, I'm throwing brain ranges at you and things like this, it can often give a layer of biology that, that people might start to shift that and either be more convinced by it and or there's a risk that they might start to actually draw away from the fact and think, well, it's all in somebody's head, right? It's the brain. It's the, neuro, it's the neural activity. And it's a really important thing of everything I'm talking to you about here, I'm talking about how someone's brain responds to a cue in their environment, right? So it's how they respond to advertising. It's how they respond to a particular gaming setting. It's all of these dynamics. So I want to be really clear when we're talking about neuroscience and what neuroscience brings to the debate and how it can help us, what neuroscience is really showing us, it goes back to this idea of gambling, this public health issue, because it's about how our brains respond to the world around us. And in that space, there are a variety of triggers that may be more likely to increase the risk of some of these atypical brain activities. Um, I have two minutes to go, so I've done that pretty swiftly. Sorry, I, probably, I went through that, apologies, but I had too much coffee. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. And that's interesting. And maybe we'll come on to discuss what kind of neuroscientific evidence is is considered by by the ASA and, and the CAP when you're when you're looking at that because it's an it's an interesting area and an emerging area. Um, so thank thank you very much for that, Michael. Um, we'll move on to Steffi de Jans now. She's come to us from uh, from Ghent in Belgium, not quite as far as Singapore, so she doesn't quite win the prize. Um, Steffi is a postdoctoral researcher, and she's going to talk to us about the implications of the ban on gambling advertising in Belgium. So Andy's explained to us that gambling advertising is not banned in the UK so the regulations are about how to make it safer because it's not in your remit to ban it. Belgian government has decided to ban gambling advertising and that was a government decision and they, they made that decision. Um, so I mean Steffi works uh, on mainly on how to help children and also adults be empowered to, to deal with advertising messages and um, today she's going to talk to us about, about the Belgian ban and what that might mean. So over to you, Steffi. Yes, good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm indeed postdoc researcher at the Department of um, Communication Sciences at Ghent University. And uh, now I'm funded as a postdoc fellow at the Research Foundation uh, Flanders. And in my postdoc project, um, which lasts for three years, I investigate. Sorry. 
that was my fault. <laughs> I investigate how consumers are affected by gambling advertising and also how we can empower them to cope more critically with this advertising. But today I would like to talk to you about um, the situation in Belgium regarding gambling advertising and more specifically the regulatory situation because as Agnes already um, said, as of the 1st of July um, of this year, nearly all forms of gambling advertising are banned in Belgium. So this means uh, advertising on television, on radio, in magazines, on social media, outdoors, also personalized advertising via mail, via text messages are all banned. There are some transitional measures with regard to sports sponsoring. So for now, sports sponsoring is still allowed, but as of the 1st of January 2025, also all advertising will be banned in sports stadiums. So there can be no advertising um, there, but then there is still an exception for shirt sponsoring. So shirt sponsoring will still be allowed for a few years, but this will also be banned from the 1st of January 2028. So then also shirt sponsoring will be banned, but then there is still an ex exception for amateur clubs. So the sports sponsoring will only be banned in professional sports clubs, but it will still be allowed in um, amateur sports clubs. And because of this situation in Belgium, where nearly all forms of gambling advertising are banned, but the sports sponsoring uh, by gambling brands is still allowed, we now have several ongoing research uh, projects on this topic of gambling sponsorships. And for example, we conducted a systematic literature study where we looked at all research already conducted on gambling sponsorship. And for example, we found, uh, as we all know, that gambling brands are omnipresent in sports, in the lives of both adults, adolescents, but of course, also children. There has also been a, a positive association established between the exposure to gambling sponsorships in sports and gambling-related outcomes, such as gambling intentions and behaviors. And of course, in literature also, um, a lot of ethical concerns have been raised about this omnipresence of gambling brands in sports, such as um, the fact that um, it may normalize gambling, um, but it also may decrease risk perceptions about gambling. It may increase gambling fallacies, so cognitive biases you have with regard to advertising, such as the illusion of control. And of course, by connecting yourself as a gambling brand with sports, this healthy and fun image of sports can be transferred to the gambling brand, but also to gambling in general. And this is referred to as the health uh, halo effect. Now, these previous for this previous research that has already been conducted on gambling sponsorship have mainly conducted survey research. So this indicates that they can only conclude correlational statements. And that's why uh, we wanted in our um, research projects to really examine the causal relations between exposure to gambling sponsorships in sports and gambling related outcomes. So for now, we have already conducted some experiments to examine these causal relations. And in our Experiments, we compared a gambling sponsor with a banking sponsor because this is a rather neutral sponsor um, in Belgium. And um, we actually found that people were rather critical or that Belgian sports fans, because that was our target audience, that they were rather critical and skeptical towards gambling sponsorships in sports. So compared to the banking sponsor, we found that... Um, they found the gambling sponsorship morally inappropriate, that they also um, did not really see a fit between a gambling brand and a soccer team, and that they also found the gambling sponsor less sincere compared to the banking sponsor. And actually, um, a bit in contrast to what we expected, we found that uh, exposure to the gambling sponsorship even decreased the normalization of gambling and increased risk perceptions about the gambling. And that it also negatively, indirectly affected the gambling sponsor and um, the sponsored soccer team. So it also had detrimental effects for both the gambling sponsor, but also for the sports team. It was the soccer team in our case that was being sponsored. But of course, it's important to note that um, these were only two experimental studies 
that it is, of course, a forced exposure to a situation of um, gambling sponsorship, and that it is really challenging to actually experimentally investigate the um, marketing tactic of sponsorship. And to end up um, with uh, or to return to the general ban on gambling advertising in Belgium, we do see that gambling brands really adhere to the reg regulations imposed. So we barely see any gambling advertising anymore where it is um, where it is banned. But of course, um, we already see some shifts. So the the ban has only been implemented for three months now, but we already see some shifts. Um, with regard to their advertising budget. So, for example, we see that they are now increasingly supporting good causes and communicating about that. So, cause marketing, cause related marketing. But we also see that they are increasing their visibility on search engines. So, while pushed advertising is banned, advertising is still allowed when you actively seek or look for gambling related content so when you go to google and you type in gambling related words or keywords then you can still get um, gambling advertising so therefore we see that um, budgets have really gone up for search engine optimization for search engine advertising so platforms like google have become yeah, the real winners in this scenario because advertising costs on search engines have gone up um, increasingly. Um, so these are only the recent trends that we have um, seen that have emerged for now. But like I said, it has only been three months and I'm very curious to see where it will uh, will go and how it will evolve further. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steffi. That was a really, really um, rich presentation. Um, you know, the. the the issues of trying to get um, causation in, in gambling harms research is, is a really big one um, that you've alluded to. And also very interesting that if you do ban gambling advertising, it's not the end of the story because, of course, behavior um, moves to, to go around about the regulations, as is always the case. It's interesting that's happened in the first three months. So th thank you very much for that. So last but by absolutely no means least, um, we have Guy Bray, who's a, a youth advisor at GamCare. And he's going to talk about unpacking youth gambling and the influence of advertising. Um, now, Guy brings a, a unique and passionate perspective as someone with lived experience and also active involvement with organizations such as Gampair and Gamble Aware. He's an advocate for the youth voice in discussions about advertising and gambling. And we really, really welcome his perspective to the discussion today. Thank you, Guy. Thank you, Agnes. Well, um, building on that theme of sort of research and evidence, um, by the age of 16, one in five people have already gambled for money within the last year. And it's an underestimate to say that this is a huge amount of people. Just seeing it written as one in five doesn't do it any justice. To contextualize, this is the equivalent of two and a half million people placing money and placing bets on gambling each year, and they're 16 and under. But to me at least, this doesn't feel like shocking news. Having been to school and currently being in school, I can confidently say there is very much a culture that has been built around gambling. During break and lunch, I often found myself bringing in poker sets and uh, chips and playing with friends, and often we'd be betting money on trivial things and small chances. And because of this, everything would become a game and we would love playing it. But why is this the case? What even caused us to do that in the first place? Well, one thing I can confidently point to is a continuous and repetitive exposure to adverts across all forms of media. I've never had a TV license in my early years, so I've never really been exposed to the commonly scrutinized TV adverts. But despite this, I still saw these adverts frequently. And for me, this came in the form of various places online. For years now, we've been focused on this idea of lottery tickets and football being the biggest concern for the youth. This can be seen by the pages of extensive and positive regulations published by the ASA in their gambling and lotteries guidance protecting under 18s. However, one of the biggest issues we are facing now is the expansion of online gaming and the prevalence of esports among young people. In my school, I do not know a single person that has never played a game. In fact, most people are clocking in hours of them a day, either at school in between lessons on their phones, or at home when they can play on a computer or a console. Among these games, you hear big names such as League of Legends, Dota, FIFA, and Valorant. I have personally played each and every one of these, and all of these games have a large youth player base to back them. And can you guess which of these are also being featured in eSport betting? Now, if you thought all of the ones I just mentioned, then you would be absolutely right. If you're a gambling company, it only but makes sense to start investing in this new sport with one and a half million peak viewers and a prize pool of $1 million just for one of those games alone. What profit maximizing company wouldn't call it worthwhile? 
But unfortunately, this isn't even where the problem stops. Instead, from this point, all that happens is it gets worse. Once the advertising has done its job of luring you to the site of any of the top 10 online betting platforms in the country, you're greeted with their shiny and interactive front page. Once you're on this, you can see all the options laid out in front of you. You can choose whether you want to lose a bit of your life on the online casinos, the sports, or any of the other games they offer. As soon as you're on the site, you are being dragged in, with companies desperately trying to pull you into their inescapable and honey-laden trap. They say, here are your expected winnings if you place a bet on this, making it seem more like a simple investment rather than a risk. They detach you from that reality that is making a risk. And at this point, it isn't unrealistic to assume that someone in their youth would be too uninterested to leave. And I know this because as I was on, going onto their websites to simply have a look around, I was constantly battling back and forth with the idea of whether it was worth it to just put that bit of money down. Now, age verification can work very well. However, if you're a young person desperate to try something out, everything seems reasonable to get to it. And uh, given you only need to put in a name, an address, and a birthday of someone who's over 18, as long as you have that information, you can sign up immediately. And uh, who doesn't have their parents' uh, address and date of birth? So with my parents' permission, I filled in their details, and within literal seconds, I was already being asked how much I wanted to deposit. All the games, all the casinos, all the sports I'd seen in the adverts, it was available to me almost immediately. I just had to put that bit of money down first. And as soon as you're in, there is no end to it. Like a casino without windows, so you don't know the difference between night and day. Um, there are long cancellation plans and long waiting periods to withdraw money, so you are nicely secured with a lock and chain. And we need to stop people getting pulled into this, and the key is on advertisements. The Advertising Standards Authority recently has taken steps to address advertisements for under 18s, uh, including the new rule that gambling and lottery ads must not be likely to be of strong appeal to children or young persons, especially by reflecting or associating with youth culture. And in practice, this means that uh, regulation, the regulations mean that celebrities, including football players and reality TV stars, are now banned from appearing in gambling and lottery advertisements. And this is making an impact. A report from the ASA found that in 2020, children saw half the TV adverts compared to 2013. However, this still means they're exposed to an average of 2.8 ads per week, with 2020 still being the reference year. And uh, not only that, but a study done by Bristol University in 2018 was looking at the presence of gambling within social media on Twitter specifically and found that 888,000 tweets were made to um, betting, were made about betting and gambling, reaching an audience of 4.8 million people. 6% of the followers were for traditional gambling accounts were youth, and for esports, that figure became more like 17. This isn't even including estimates on how many of those accounts were used with fake dates of birth as well. More needs to be done. The point of gaming has always been to escape reality, and gambling is much the same. Expected winnings, flashy lifestyles, and tremendous riches. The expansion of esports and gaming is only getting bigger. With the relationship between the two and gambling in mind, it's vital that advertising rules and regulations get on the front foot of this space immediately. We need updated regulations. We need input and collaboration with the young people who are actually affected as trends in the online environment ever changes around us. I'm a member of the Youth Advisory Board at GAMCARE, and we're a group of people that meet up regularly to ensure that the work of GAMCARE is relevant and meets the needs of young people throughout the UK. We see firsthand how appealing adverts can be to young people, 92% of our youth advisory board agree that gambling adverts can influence children, and a further 85% agree that gambling adverts shouldn't have famous people advertising gambling products. We harbor a wide range of relevant and up-to-date views on the influence that gambling has on young people. Now, we want to offer to work with and collaborate with the ASE to ensure that they are seeing the same things that we do. And I'm pleased that Andy Taylor is here representing the Committee of Advertising Practice. I'd like to thank him for being a part of the panel and conversation, as well as for his work in the area. Andy, I would thus love to offer a meeting with yourself and GAMCARE to discuss your work and our ambitions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Guy. It's wonderful to have your perspective. And thank you for introducing the subject of esports into, into the conversation. It's, a, it's a, an under-researched area, as we know. And um, thank you for offering to work with Andy. Andy, are you happy to work with Guy? Things you are so nice. <laughs> No, absolutely. As I said before, evidence, so evidence base comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we've found is that what, what appeals to children is usually dealt with by adults. 
So having a youth panel would be would be a wonderful thing. If that's something we could take away from this conference, I think we'd all be very happy. I think no, it is an interesting point, and obviously we do get input from a variety of different sources. I mean, in terms of actual regulatory decision making, the code's concept for everything is to establish tests, which the ASA applies rather than asking um, sort of an opinion on a case by case basis. Also making underlying those standards and tests. So we'd be very happy to, to sit down at some point in the not too distant future and discuss matters. You did, you did say earlier you didn't have a template for deciding that. No, in the sense of, of submissions. Um, uh, you know, we don't have a sort of a, you must do this, this and this. Oh, I see. But it's not for your decision. That no, no. Uh, we, I mean, ultimately, what we you know, we invite people to submit evidence. Um, and this is a particularly hot topic. It's important. There are real harms here. So in which case, the invitation is a bit more open than usually uh, than usually it is. Um, in terms of the way we decide um, on evidence, we have to, to look at that evidence. We let it speak. There's no sort of, so computer says no approach, etc. We see what the evidence can show us and tell us, realising it can't tell us everything um, and then we look to see whether that has a consequence in terms of our standards we obviously have a lot of standards and rules in place is this it is a piece of evidence something significant that will bring big change or is it something perhaps that need you know requires a fine tuning a, a, a slight change we're looking you know we look we look to give the evidence the opportunity to influence our policy um, as much as reasonably that we can but obviously we have to balance that with our role of uh, you know, our evidence-based approach and um, we can't deliver extreme or, or far-reaching um, interventions when the evidence doesn't point to that. We always have to balance that and make a judgment. Sure. Now, it's now time to throw this open to the floor. I've got some questions online already, so I'll pick these while you think of your questions. Um, so this is one from Michael. Um, this is um, Rosalind Baker-Frampton, and she said she was wondering if there are any structural brain changes in people suffering from gambling harm. Yeah, so the, the answer is... Yes, there are structural differences, at least in the literature today. Um, you need to be mindful that the data on, on some of the brain changes sometimes the same types of brain is coming up. There, there are changes that are important, and there can sometimes be increases in some kind deep in area reported. So it's a bit of a mix too. But some of those common areas, like the prefrontal cortex, we've alluded to, um, some of the other kind of more subcortical structures, there are structural changes reported. But the important things on that as well to be mindful of is that the brain is incredibly plastic. So um, those changes, although they might appear, doesn't necessarily mean they can't also be reversed over time as well, right? So it's also important to keep that in mind in that space. Right. Um, Steffi, is advertising still possible in bookmaker windows? And if so, is there any discussion on how the visibility on the high street might change? They can still advertise on their own platforms, so on their own websites. So I do not think it's possible on the bookmaker websites. No, but I think this is about the actual on the street, the way, you um, know, bookmaker on the street. Yeah, they can put up flags, um, but the betting shops are still there. But we do see a trend now in Belgium where a lot of cities are also banning those betting shops. So they're really oh, closing wow. them in, in several cities now. And we really see a trend that a lot of cities are following. The, so that's also a very good um, development. But of course, like in news agents shops, you still see um, you still see the um the uh, the outdoor uh, posters etc and also because um we also have the national lottery in belgium and they do not fall under the ban so um they have an, another regulation um and they are still allowed to um to advertise their products so only their lottery products of course so they also have betting products which they can't advertise but um we see or we still see a lot of advertising from the national lottery who's also in in the betting shops and in the news agent shops so it is it is still there yeah right. that's interesting so is it city councils that will shut down bookmakers yeah they, they've got the power to do that yeah right that's, yeah that's interesting it's quite interesting to see how different regulations in different countries apply thank, thank you for that um do we take a question from the floor do we have any questions from the floor yet no go on over there
you. Um, Ruth Persian from the Behavioural Insights team. I've got a question for Steffi as well. I was just interested, um, given how far reaching the ban was, um, what sort of the approach by the regulator was in terms of evidence, because Andy's been speaking a lot about, you know, how important evidence is. And yeah, I was just interested on the thinking there. Well, actually, um, we also only heard from um, from the ban or the plans for, for the royal decree to ban the advertising in the media. So um, it was also uh, surprising for us to see. And we were also very curious, like on, on which evidence um, their plans were based. So therefore, we contacted um, the the. the politician who was who was working on that and then they um, started a call to um, to research specifically with regard to the gambling sponsorships because that was um, a really big thing in Belgium there was a lot of discussion about that um, because also like the media sector the sports sector were really against that because of course they were losing a lot of money if if the plans um, were going through so therefore they um, launched a call for some research which we then did and then we conducted um, the studies on, on gambling advertising in, in sports sponsorship and we conducted the experimental studies and um, the systematic literature um, study that I talked about was also um, funded by the, the Belgian um, ministry. Thank you. Okay, I've got lots more questions on here. Um, let's go to one about loot boxes in gaming. I mean, maybe Guy, you could tell us what you think about loot boxes and then maybe we could talk about how they're being regulated. And maybe if you know anything about loot boxes and the brain and what's happening with loot boxes in Belgium, I think it's something that I think everyone should have a, have a view on. Yeah. Um, start, yeah. Well, I'd never start off. So I think loot box is quite often a term which is given one definition and everyone thinks very much of one stringent, like, sorry, one particular thing. So you might instantly think of like Fortnite or something and then just their loot boxes there. But in reality, if we're talking more broadly about the sense of gambling within games, there's a huge sort of industry in that bit. And there's a lot of like a lot of uh, companies, for example, will sell their game for free. Uh, but then, of course, how do they make the money sustain it? And that's through what, what I what I view as introducing addictive patterns early into the game. So you hear about, you know, people being addicted to gaming itself, like spending hours on games. But what about what they actually do in the games? Often you can find that people, you know, spend money, put it into an in-game currency, and then they detach themselves from the value of that actual money. And then they'll spend that on whatever sort of gambling opportunity that comes from, either in the form of loot boxes or in the form wow. of getting something new and having a, you know, some sort of chance to get that. So you might be like summoning something or whatever, and there's a 0.01% chance of getting this really cool, really useful thing. It comes up in many different forms and we can't just think of it as, you know, in Fortnite where you just get a box, you open it with a key or whatever. There are, there are so many different patterns, so many different games which have it in. So to say it's loot boxes, um, there are rules and regulations on loot boxes currently, but I would say to perhaps broaden your sort of uh, spectrum, well, broaden our spectrum on what we can define as gambling and within games. Thank you. Have you got a perspective on loot boxes and what we can and can't regulate, given that it's quite a tricky subject with that. It's a very good example of you know, things from an advertising regulatory perspective. It's a very good example of, of where you, you regulate downstream from what government gambling commission established. Loot boxes are not legally classified. In general, they're not legally classified as gambling. Yeah. So in which case, we can't apply gambling-specific regulations to them. Um, what we do apply to them is, is based in sort of general consumer protection law about not uh, uh, sort of the advertising for loot boxes. We obviously don't re uh, regulate loot boxes themselves, but their advertising shouldn't, and they should make clear um, that, that basically there was a chance of you getting what, what you see in terms of the top prize, um, but it's only those, I think, the need um, for, you know, Sort of interventions from, from researchers, et cetera, in terms of putting putting a case, you know, sending those to the right post box. And this is one for the, the government, the gambling commission, in order to with the problem at the framework level. Yeah. In Belgium, Steffi, are loot boxes classified as gambling or not? Well, I'm not really an expert in the the gambling uh, the gambling elements in gaming, but I, uh, if I'm correct, they are um, they're also not allowed the loot boxes. But I, I guess there was a study showing that um, yeah, there are still a lot of a lot of loot boxes in the games um, because it's also very difficult to monitor. I guess 
Um, and also because youth are playing games not only nationally, but all, also internationally. So I think it's really difficult to actually monitor. Right, okay. And is there um, any research on neuroscientific research on, on loop boxes? No. I think, I think it is an area where we do more, yeah. just more broadly in terms of gambling and gaming, um, particularly given some of the developmental age groups that you allude to. And we know that a lot of those groups, a lot of the brain areas that um, different in relation to gambling where the challenges lie, um, they often don't reach maturity when they're not until their mid 20s. So actually, they're more sensitive. It's a really sensitive, pressing issue, I think. Research challenge for would like to take it up. I have a good question here. Thank you. I think this is for Andy. Um, if if there are gambling affiliate sites that are advertising illegal and those affiliates are also advertising legal regulated operators, which many of them are as well, um, legal regulated oper operators are responsible for the content of their affiliates can can take enforcement action against those operators to stop the promotion of unregulated sites which seek to circumvent consumer protections for the gambling commission but they have effectively we, we regulate legitimate gambling advertising stuff that's licensed and and gambling advertising that's unlicensed. As to the sort of the cumulative effect, I think that's a new question. I haven't heard that, that one before in terms of the fact that basically the legitimates are allowing um, their themselves to be placed with the illegitimate. Um, I think it's an... Thank you, my name is Martin Jones. Um, when I look at the stats from children and young people, I get very depressed. The uh, Gambling Commission quotes prevalence of uh, children gambling at 0.9 compared to the adult figure of 0.3, uh, which uh, may not be directly comparable. That gives me pause to think that that's a very negative stat to look at. And the survey by YGAM of 2000 undergraduates indicated 70% gambling and 40% of those probably had problems with their gambling, indicating the problem gambling prevalence in uh, undergraduates is an order of magnitude worse than the general population. So uh, whatever we're doing in control and regulation of advertising, it's not immune from contributing to those pessimistic stats. Um, the only link I've got is, is that in uh, controlling adverts not to be uh, appealing to children. Am I right in thinking that the, the yardstick is if no more than 25% of the audience are children, then that's okay. Have I got that around my neck? And if that is anywhere near true, shouldn't that be tightened up a bit? Thank you. In, in terms of, of the policy, uh, it depends on what the media is. Um, so if it's, uh, if it's a general audience, if it is a general audience media, um, that it is basically not, it, it, you are not able to gate that media. 25% um, criteria in the threshold applies. Um, if a piece of content is subjectively assessed as being for children, then data doesn't matter. That's a prohibited space. Um, if the media is targeted, so this is all online techniques. So for example, um, using behavioral targeting in display advertising, then that's a one-to-one -one communication. So in which case that there's no percentages involved there. Every single one of those communications sent out, however a million of them, must be done so on the basis of criteria that are designed to minimize the possibility of it going to someone included within that um, are requirements that simple sort of basic sort of infer inferred data is not a reasonable to make those judgments. So the 25% criteria applies, but only in some spaces. Um, but I would say that you, you tend in terms of media audiences, there's not a sort of a gradation. There are, you know, especially in online spaces, you have much more content. So you have them. Um, you don't have the old world of general media that has the full audience. So you will get um, 
basically the dial will swing very strongly towards children and young people, and that's obviously something restricted. Um, and the dial will swing quite strongly to things for adults because of the sort of specificity of the kind of content which is produced. So that does aid us. Um, in terms of the 25% threshold, its basis is simply that that would show that children are slightly overrepresented um, compared to their proportion in the population. Yes, to say children and, and, and young people, so under 18s. So that's the basis for simple as that. There are um, various other things that we specifics of different media environments. Thank you very much. Um, um, we've reached the end of the session. We have a huge round of applause for our panelists.